Hey, listener, heads up. This episode discusses abuse of a child by a parent and also rape. If that is going to be really challenging for you, we recommend listening to a different one of our episodes. Thanks so much. Welcome to Sex Ed with DB. I'm your host, Danielle Bezalow. Let's get into it. Welcome back to the podcast. If you love and support the work that we do, join my crew on Patreon to win amazing prizes like our adorable merch, exclusive behind the scenes content, private sessions with yours truly, and incredible sex toys. Go to patreon.com slash sexedwithdb to join my crew. Get discounts at all of my favorite brands at sexedwithdb.com. And follow us on Instagram at sexedwithdbpodcast and on TikTok at sexedwithdb. If you want to partner with us, email us at sexedwithdb at gmail.com. Five reasons you will masturbate more with Freya. Number one, masturbation increases the release of endorphins, which decreases stress, tension, and depression. Number two, masturbation can help you sleep better. Number three, masturbating can help strengthen and tone your pelvic floor. Number four, masturbation can lessen period cramps. Number five, masturbation can empower you to know your body better and know what feels good. Freya is the innovative premium razor and vibrator in one that gives you an amazing shave and the best clitoral workout ever. Use code SEXEDWITHDB to get 20% off your Freya. And for a limited time, you can enter to buy one Freya and get one for your bestie for free. Enter to win at highfreya.com slash sexedwithdb now. In a world that constantly encourages you to change, it's bold to just be yourself. Sexual expression and satisfaction are different for everybody, so rather than conforming to others, focus on falling in love with who you are. Lion's Den sources the very best products to help you find what you like and help you feel confident expressing your sexual desires. You can get 15% off in-store and online using code SEXEDWITHDB at lionsden.com to begin exploring everything about yourself. Follow them on social at Lions Den Adult on Instagram and TikTok. Want to win your very own Magic Wand Mini? If so, keep on listening. Ooh, it's kind of fun to have your attention. Okay, but let's get into it. Magic Wand, aka the best-selling wand vibrator of all time, has partnered with Sex Ed with DB to give some magic wands away to some lucky winners. How can you participate and enter to win? We want to hear your best magic wand story. Maybe something funny or silly comes to mind. Maybe the magic wand unlocked a world of pleasure for you like it did for me. Whatever it is, we want to hear your story. Go to sexedwithdb.com slash magic wand to learn more and see how you could win your very own magic wand mini. Let's talk about lube and condoms. Something important to know is that oil-based lube is not to be used with condoms because the oil can cause the condom to break or tear, which would defeat the purpose of using it. Thank goodness for Uber Lube. Uber Lube is latex compatible, so it's safe and effective to use with condoms. But wait, there's more. Dispensing two drops of Uber Lube inside a condom and a measured pump outside will increase pleasure. What are you waiting for? Use code SEXEDWITHDB for 15% off at uberlube.com. When it comes to sex, most of us have never had access to proper education, especially when it comes to the butt. This means both beginners and experienced players have had to turn to porn, friends, or Reddit to figure out how to properly prepare, play, and care for our butts. This doesn't sound safe now, does it? That's where Future Method comes in. Future Method was founded by a doctor to help people have informed, healthy, amazing sex because we should feel good in our skin and when we're playing with our partners. If you want to learn more about how to bottom safely, go to futuremethod.com and use code SEXED with DB for 15% off their amazing products. Madam Namio, welcome to the podcast. Hi. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? I am good. I'm really, really glad to be able to talk to you um, and have you on the show today. So thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Hell yeah. Let's tell everyone who you are. Go ahead and introduce yourself and just tell us about your work. Okay, so my name is Madam Namio. I am a retired pro-dominatrix. I was a pro-dom and sex worker for about seven to eight years, possibly longer because I was doing I was doing sex work stuff before I knew that that's what it was called. And now I am a licensed esthetician who focuses on sugaring hair removal practices. And I enjoy giving my clients a trauma-informed, knowledge-informed experience about 
how to take care of their skin. Cause unfortunately that's not something that's really taught to us. And that's for a reason, because the less, you know, the more you'll buy things mm. and the more shame you feel for things that are quote unquote, not normal, the more you'll pay to get them fixed. When in reality, there's really nothing to fix at all. Those are, they're all normal skin issues. And now instead of doing pro-dom work, I try to do some pleasure educating, some kink educating, and just trying to instill the knowledge that I learned from that craft into my other business ventures and also how I care for other people and myself. Yeah, you are very, uh, you have a lot of titles, a lot of jobs. You're doing a lot of things, a lot of passions. (laughs) Yeah, it's exhausting. (laughs) Okay, so let's just talk about your sex ed growing up, right? Like, I want to know what made you so passionate about this work. Like, how how did you get here, basically? So my sex education was pretty minimal, but it was still like a little better than some other stories that I've heard, but it was also just kind of like skewed because unfortunately I was, I was living in a very abusive household where my mother kind of kept me isolated from everybody in order to keep doing what she was doing to me. She really did try in terms of sex ed, like she would leave books around the house. She would leave like pamphlets And I remember she would like tell me that like, you know, like it's okay to use mirrors to like look at Mm. yourself and things like that, which like looking back on it now, I do appreciate those things. But a lot of it really though was about like how not to get pregnant. And it was all just like extremely heteronormative and just like there was no discussion of kinks, of fetishes, of anything kind of existing outside of sex between a cisgender man and woman. Like that, that, that was the only scope in which I was taught things. And I was taught like, oh, you know, like you get your period and stuff. But that was basically it. All the other stuff I had to kind of learn on my own. And I wish I would have been more exposed to those things because like, Mm -hmm. I didn't know what pansexual was until I went to college, like until my sophomore year of college. That was the first time I had ever even heard of pansexuality or bisexuality, anything like that. And that was like the first time that I started to realize like, oh, wait a minute. Like there's like a name for this, these things that I'm feeling. And also just like, yes, like I, I knew like, oh, you get your period and this is how it works. But there was no sort of explanation of just the fact that like everyone's body is different. And, and this is something that I teach my clients all the time. Like I have sugared thousands of genitals and I have never seen two that look the same. It's like a fingerprint. Mm. So it's like, you know, like when I would look at myself in the mirror growing up and be like, oh, like, why is it shaped like that? Like the ones that I see online don't look like that. Well, of course they don't look like everybody's is different. Yeah. You're the only you basically, exactly. right? It's not going to, it's not going to look the same. And that's the coolest thing about it. So I really wish that I had more of that and more of a cohesive sex education experience that wasn't just centered around heteronormity. And also there wasn't any kind of focus on pleasure ever. It was always about what happens. Um, This is how you don't get pregnant. This is why you get tested regularly. Uh, This is why you use condoms. That was basic, but there was no sort of discussion about pleasure and that That is a huge miss, a huge miss. And it's super detrimental because pleasure is a part of your health. Totally. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, an important part, very important part. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate, first of all, thank you for sharing your story. I'm sorry that you experienced that growing up. 
And at the same time, I'm appreciative of the nuance that you're bringing of like, but when it comes to, you know, sex ed, my mom really did try her best or left books or pamphlets. Like, I think that it's not always black and white and that gray area is really important to share. That's why I I always talk about it because everybody always, in everybody's head, abusers are just like all bad and they're Mm. evil and they hide in corners and they're just like waiting to hurt you. When in reality, most of the time, abusers are just like really hurt people that instead of doing the work that they need to do to take care of themselves and to rid themselves of their pain, they think that they have the right to do it to other people. And they're not going to just do it in a way that can get them caught. They're often going to be the people that you look at and you're like, wow, that person is so nice. Like they must be such a great parent. They work so hard. Like people that really put themselves out there, like really out there in a kind of physical sense, like, oh, wow, you can really see them doing all these things. It's a lot, a lot of the times it's to compensate for what they're doing behind closed doors. And that's why it's really important to listen to people when they say like, no, this was my experience with this person. And Mm -hmm. it's also important to understand that like, when it comes to parents, a lot of the times, like hurt people or like people that get pleasure from harming others have children because children are kind of the perfect victim in a sense, because you can mold them into anything you want them to be until they get the selfhood or self-awareness to that, to leave. And that was Mm. kind of my situation was I was really molded to be like my mom's number one sidekick. I would defend her in anything. I would put up with anything. And she had me wrapped around her finger, believing everything. She had me convinced that like I was a disease and that like my very presence could get other people like physically ill. And that isolated me from everybody. And it's important to talk about these things because they swell and they thrive in silence in silence just because that was my experience as a child. And that is where I come from. Like I came from these two people who may have had the best intentions, but they were terrible parents and they didn't want to work on their shit and that's on them. But just because they chose to do those things to me, that doesn't mean that it's going to dictate the rest of my life or dictate my future. And that's kind of why like, getting into BDSM became such like a really cathartic healing thing for me because BDSM taught me how to instill boundaries. And I didn't know how to do that. I was literally just going to say like, what an interesting way to queue up for the next part of this interview, right? Which is about like how you chose to pursue your career and your passions. And these aren't separate, right? Like obviously we come from a very particular experience when it comes to our parents, our guardians who raised us. And that absolutely impacts the way in which that we interact with the outside world. And so perfect segue. I want to talk about your work as a dominatrix and stand-up comedian and the term domedian, which you yeah. have uh, which you have all, all over your socials and your website, which I really love. But again, you know, you mentioned some of these titles in the beginning of the interview, but you're also an artist, a writer, a model, a speaker, a licensed esthetician, which we'll get into. What does this look like in your everyday life? Like, tell me a little bit more about how you incorporate like comedian-ness, comedy, that's the right word, into like being a dominatrix and like vice versa. I retired dom work kind of after the passing of SESTA-FOSTA and the pandemic just because it it just became way too difficult. And I also needed a break because it is a lot of work, but there are so many aspects to it that are just funny. Like there are some things that you get asked to do where it's, it's fucking funny. Like it's funny. Like give me some examples. I would do a lot of custom video work for clients and it would range from like videos of like deep detailed videos of my armpits to like oh, wow. brushing things with my feet 
But my favorite one was uh, this guy asked me to do like a tease and denial video. So basically you're edging the person Mm -hmm. where you get them really, really, really excited, but they're not allowed to come until you tell them to. And sometimes you don't even tell them. Like they're just, it's just like the, the, it's like the frustrating aspect and the like, oh, like I, I shouldn't be doing this, but I am doing it. That's like very attractive to them. I'm so bad. Yeah, exactly. But his thing, he was like, can you make it about Lord of the Rings? Oh. And I was like, yes, yes. I love Lord of the Rings. (laughs) Absolutely. And I had this like silver wig, this like, it was such a shitty wig. It was really (laughs) bad. And I put it on and like, I cut like a little piece of like the back of it that that wasn't going to show in the video. And I kind of like just put some spirit gum here. And I had like a dildo and I was just like, you want to come so bad, Frodo blue balls. Like, oh, wow. You no, know, you really want to. And then I did the whole Gandalf thing, but I was like, you shall not come. Come, Yes. Like it was so, I, and it was, I had to do that take like multiple times because it was fun. Like it's fucking funny. Like it, it, it's hilarious. And there are just so many ass. So I just made it. When you first start out, there's no rule book to this. There's no handbook. You're really just doing a lot of your own research and figuring it out for yourself. So in the beginning, I was just really nervous because I was like, oh, am I, I'm supposed to be like serious all the time. Like, you know, because that's how a real dominant is. And then once I really started researching it, it's like that's not a dominant is somebody who relies on the foundations of BDSM, which is communication and consent. And a dominant is someone who's just like really just like sure of themselves. And that's why they're able to like take charge. And also they're not only sure of themselves, but they're able to like create a safe enough space for the submissive to give the power over to them. I don't have to have like a certain added, I have to be myself. And myself is like, yeah, I can be like mean. I can also find a way to read you. That's really funny. But like, I'm also going to joke about it. Like, I was known in my sessions a lot for like laughing because I would laugh at because it's hilarious. Like, bro, like I got you strapped up. You show up to my session with like multiple, like a jock strap with multiple chains on it that lead into a butt plug that's in your ass right now. And you were at work all day. Like, it's funny. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Really It's funny. like, we, we are like, I mean, I'm just thinking a lot about like masks and costumes, right? And just mm-hmm. like the way in which, not literal ones, like figurative ones, but also literal ones that they turn out to be, but just the way in which we navigate like escapism, right? Like from the real world, from our everyday responsibilities. And like you said, like some of them are like really weird. Some of them are funny. And I'm sure as part of it, you know, like some of these people, men, I presume, I'm sure they go by all all genders and all identities, but I imagine many of them are men. Actually, can you confirm or deny that? Is that true? Are, were many of your clients men? Many of them were, but like it was a good mixed bag. Okay. 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 So interesting to hear. I would love to hear more about that. Mm-hmm. But I do think that like they want to be demeaned, right? Some of them in some way and told what to do and told what not to do. And it's a mask. Like we're all wearing these masks every day of like who we are supposed to be or who we're, who we're trying to put out into the world. And this is a space that you have created for people, for them to wear a different mask and mm-hmm. like a different uniform. Yeah. And that, and that was one of the things that I really loved about it is like, I get to see something no one else gets to see. Yeah. And it's like some people trusted me enough to do that. And I, 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 as ridiculous as it was, or as like, and, or sometimes it was just like either straightforward or sometimes it's just like really sweet. Like whatever the reason was, like they trust, they trusted me enough to show that to me. And yeah. I, all, that was always like one of my favorite parts of the job is knowing that like I'm seeing a part of you that nobody else nobody else but the other sex workers are going to see this like it's really right it's 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 very a unique perspective definitely excitement intimacy anticipation contentment 
Uber Lube lets you feel all the things you want to feel when it comes to sex with yourself and with a partner. It makes sex better for everyone by reducing friction and increasing pleasure. Recommended by leading doctors, Uber Lube is body friendly, free of parabens, preservatives, and petrochemicals. Plus, Uber Lube is latex compatible, so it's safe, effective, and pleasurable to use with condoms. Try Uber Lube now with code SEXEDWITHDB for 15% off at uberlube.com. Let me tell you about one of my favorite sex toy shops out there, Lion's Den. If you haven't heard about Lion's Den before, I can't wait to tell you all about them. Lion's Den first opened its retail facility in Columbus, Ohio in 1971. That's right, over 50 years ago. Since then, they have grown to more than 50 outlets throughout the U.S., building its reputation on high-quality products, low prices, and a knowledgeable sales staff. Their staff are also sexual wellness experts who can help you find the perfect toy. One of the many things I love about Lion's Den is that they advocate for a sex-positive perspective on intimacy and sexual well-being, and strive to break the stereotypes and stigma surrounding sex by providing comprehensive educational resources to empower everyone to enjoy life to the fullest. They're simply amazing. Lucky for you, Lion's Den is giving my listeners an exclusive discount of 15% off your purchase in-store and online with code SEXEDWITHDB at lionsden.com. What are you waiting for? Get your amazing Lion's Den toy now. Understanding how to love ourselves and our bodies can take practice, time, and energy. Freya believes that it's really important to invest in loving the body you're in, and pleasure plays a huge part in that. I know it does for me. When I'm able to access my pleasure, I'm able to feel and see my body in a whole new way. My pleasure empowers me. That's why I love Freya. It's more than a razor and a vibe. It's a movement to practice loving ourselves with intention. For those who haven't tried a vibrator, this is a great first-timer product to venture into and explore your own pleasure. Learn more about Freya and their self-love movement at highfreya.com slash sexedwithdb. When it comes to anal sex, what comes to mind? If you're a beginner like so many of us out there, maybe you feel scared, unsure, or just plain uneducated. Future Method can help with that. Founded by a doctor and anal sex expert, Future Method develops science-backed products and non-judgmental doctor-led education to maximize pleasure, eliminate injury, and empower the way people choose to play in the bedroom. They even have a blog started by the gay community and now for everyone that puts education at the forefront on topics both popular and taboo. Use code SEXEDWITHDB for 15% off at futuremethod.com. Finally, we can travel again. If you're like me, I bet you want a little pleasure while you're away, but can't fit your entire sex toy collection in your carry-on, huh? Say hello to the Magic Wand Mini. Born into such a famous family, this little wand has quite a reputation to uphold. Challenge accepted. Offering big power, multiple speeds, and unsurpassed quality, the full-featured Magic Wand Mini is more than simply a smaller sibling. It's here to create a legacy all its own. Want to win a Magic Wand Mini for your next trip or staycation? Go to sexedwithdb.com slash magic wand to learn more. Okay, let's talk about gender differences for a second. I think like in my head, when I picture, you know, a dominatrix, I'm thinking about like, a queer person or a woman or a non-binary person or a femme kind of being in that role. And then I'm thinking of like a cis man in like Mm -hmm. the sub role, but you're saying it was kind of a mixed bag. So I'm kind of curious to hear like some of your other clients in terms of how they identified and maybe how like the services you provided them might have been different. It was a lot of different like femme clients, non-binary clients, and a lot of the things that I noticed was just like, they just wanted to be in the presence of somebody who was actually going to like dominate them properly. Because a lot of the times, like people think that, oh, I'm just going to like pull your hair or I'm just going to do what I want to do without even like really talking to you about it. And that's completely wrong. You have to talk to the person about it. The whole thing that's happening here is it's a power exchange. The sub has to give you their power in order for you to dominate them. But the only way they're going to do it is if they feel safe enough to do it. That's why you talk beforehand. Hey, what are your hard limits? Can you be marked? Are there any places on your body that like I should know about if we're going to be doing impact play? Like, 
And you should also know, like, if you are going to be doing impact play or spanking, like, okay, cool, I'm going to hit this specific area. I'm not going to go above towards the tailbone because that can cause bruising. Like, you talk with the person because that makes them feel more comfortable. And then you've established boundaries. You've established safe words. I always do safe words and safe hand signals just in case we're in a situation where maybe they have a ball gag or maybe the music that we're playing is loud. And I want to make sure that like they can communicate with me. So I always say, listen, like one finger up means I like what you're doing, but I need you to tone it down a little bit. Two fingers stop Mm. immediately. And then on top of that, these people that, you know, you go on a date with and it's like, oh yeah, I'll dominate you. I'll do this, blah, blah, blah. They do all this shit to you. And then they don't even provide aftercare. They don't hug you. They don't get you a glass of water. They don't check in with you. How did that feel? How does your body feel now? Because there is something called the sub drop. If you don't fucking provide aftercare to your submissive, all those endorphins and all of that adrenaline and everything, it's just going to crash and they're going to feel like shit, like in an hour and whatever, like they're going to feel like absolute garbage. And that's your fault. There's care that goes into it because some of these, and that's the dangers is that like some of these people that put themselves out there to be like, oh, I'm dominant. I'll do this. You're just an abuser. Honestly, you just want to do people. You just want to use people. And that can be fine to a degree, but like, you got to have that conversation with somebody first. Like some people want to be used and some people want to be yeah, like so that that's something that some people want, but you gotta talk about that first and establish like what limits there are or whatever. That way, like, cause above all, you gotta keep people safe to a certain degree. And I think that was something that was always really desired. Like I would like to get impact play from somebody who knows what they're doing and who actually puts me and my safety first and will give me aftercare. And to be quite frank, those were some of the easiest clients to deal with. So easy. Like, be like, hi, I would like X, Y, and Z. Here is the money. Oh, you need a deposit? Let me send you a deposit right now. Like, it was so, it would be so straightforward because there's just something about horny cis men where it's like, it's like they can't read. They can't function. Like, they can't. It's crazy. Like I'll make a whole website and they'll be like, okay, but how do I book? And it's like, really? Really? I mean that, yeah, that's definitely like a a entitlement thing, right? I feel like it has to, like, it's just like, oh, like do this for me, mommy. And it's like, no, you can, (laughs) you can literally book an appointment. Like, come on. Right. A lot of the times you kind of have to coddle them through it, but like with my trans clients, my non-binary clients, the femme clients that I had, like it was always just kind of like, cool. So do you provide this service? Awesome. What are your rates? Cool. Let me send you the, like, it was always just like very straightforward. And like you said, like filled with like consent, communication, boundaries, like those are things that queer people haven't been taught definitely like growing up from their most likely from their parents so like they that community has to figure out their own boundaries and relationships by themselves and so maybe they are able to articulate it better when it comes to interactions with a dom or a sex worker as opposed to a cis man who is not really taught how to do definitely not defending them, but just saying like, it's on, it's on them. You're taught to have people provide for you. Right. Exactly. You're, you're, you're important. And it's like, you're okay. (laughs) Speaking of white straight men, I would love to talk about your project called reclamation. Um, Let me explain, explain to the listeners what this is. It is a photo project seeking to reclaim fraternity spaces ones that have been marked as dangerous for certain members of the Wesleyan community through a reversal of both role and gaze. If you're not intrigued, listener, about this project, um, just by the description, I highly recommend that you check out Madame Namio's website where you can see more. But why don't you tell us a little bit about the creation of this, what it was like for you, if you could describe it any further and the response. So reclamation was 
something that I did to just kind of get my life back. And it, it came from the fact that, so I, I went to Wesleyan University and my second month there, and it's also important to note that like I was completely completely alone. Like I didn't, I had run away from home when I was 17 and literally was just applying to schools just to get out of the horrible living situation I was in with my parents. And I got a scholarship to the school and was so excited. And then the second month that I was there, I was at a fraternity party on campus and I was raped by a frat brother there. And it was awful to say the least. And I guess like, since there was so much trauma already happening in my life, my brain just kind of took those memories and just pushed it, pushed it, buried it deep in there. And then my sophomore, my junior year of college, that same fraternity got hit with a lawsuit because someone else had been raped. And that was all my campus was talking about. And I remember specifically sitting in a class and we were talking about that. I was like, oh, like, but why didn't this person come forward sooner? And I raised my mm-hmm. hand and I was like, well, a lot of studies show that a lot of these people, they, they repress the memories because it's too traumatic. So it takes a while for you to remember what happened. And then on top of that, like there's the backlash and all this stuff. And when I said that, like, that sentence just kept like reverberating in my brain, like repression, repression, repression. And I remember I had to walk by that frat house to get to where I was living on campus. And it was like the floodgates just bursted open. And I remembered everything. I remembered everything. And my whole life got turned upside down because I decided to report him because I found out that he had done it to multiple women on campus and he wasn't, he wasn't going to stop. Like he was not going to stop. He came from a family of immense wealth and privilege. I actually had class in a building that was dedicated to his family because they paid for that building to be built. Oh God. Yeah. And I reported him. And at the time I was a part of this co-ed frat. I was popular. Like I had all these things going for me. I thought I, I had found my family and I reported him. And I remember in one of our co-ed frat meetings, like I brought his name up saying that I wanted him to be banned because he had raped me. and all of my friends completely just switched sides and I was kicked out essentially. Whoa. People that I was very close with started yelling at me saying like, well, what did you do to make him do that? Oh God. Um, How did you instigate this? And then it turned into like people that were close to me in the frat house, basically plotting to get me kicked out to fuck up my case. So essentially my entire life just got ripped out from under me because I reported this person. And when that happened, I started basically doing my research because I was just like, how am I going to win this case? How am I going to do this? And I just basically started interviewing all the survivors I could on campus to see like, what did they do? If they did report, how did that go? What happened? And I was disgusted. I was absolutely disgusted with the horrific ways in which Wesleyan University, especially President Michael Roth and his team of goons, because that's basically what they were, treated survivors on campus. They literally made their lives a living hell because If you make an example out of these people, it makes other people scared to report. And if people are scared to report, then the reporting rates look very low for prospective students that want to go to the school. So they'll look at the reporting rates and be like, oh, wow. So it looks like sexual assault doesn't happen at Wesleyan because these reports are just so low. When in reality, no, they make it horrible. So they make the process of reporting extremely painful and just honestly, super dangerous. And they do that because then the reporting rates look really low for prospective students. So they'll just be like, oh, look, like no one's reporting any rapes at Wesley and it must not be a problem there when in reality, it's completely the opposite. So 
I was completely decimated by this whole situation. And the way that I know how to kind of get my power back in situations is to make art. And I wanted to do something where I had, I go back to these places, these buildings, these symbols of people that destroyed me for something that wasn't my fault, for something that was not only my fault, but is something that they are now enabling, which was a big problem for me because I was like, you know, now you're, you're basically putting other people at risk by doing this. And I remember just doing my research and I was like, what is like the epitome of just like a strong, powerful woman? Like, what does that look like? And that was the first time I ever saw the word dominatrix. That was the first time. And I was like, what is that? And I like looked it up. And that's when I realized I was like, that's what I want to do. And that was the first time that I ever wore any kind of dom gear. That was the first time that I ever studied anything really about like fetish or anything like that. And when I put that suit on and I had that actor as a frat guy on a leash, literally on the, in in the same building where I had been raped, like I felt so powerful and beautiful and strong. And like, I didn't think it was possible to feel like that at a place that had once caused me so much pain. Like it just didn't, I didn't think it was possible. And that project was just so, so near and dear to my heart because it kind of changed the trajectory of my life. It made me realize that like, there's more to my life than pain. There's more to my worth than pain and how much I can take, which is something that had been instilled on me since I was a child being abused at home. I was always rewarded by how much pain I could take, how many beatings I could take, like how much I could take without crying. Like that was always kind of like a, a driving force. So, but when I put that Dom gear on, it just, it switched everything up. It was like, it's not about how much I can take. It's about who I am and who I am is always worthy of feeling this way, is always worthy of feeling powerful, of feeling respected, of feeling loved, and most importantly, of feeling safe. Like I deserve that because of me, not because of how much I can take. And that project, believe it or not, <laughs> it was funded by Wesley and I got Wesley to pay for all, <laughs> all the oh my <laughs> What a fucking baller, dude. That's oh, awesome. Shit. And my whole, my whole thing was like, you don't have anything here that benefits survivors. You don't. And the only things that you do have were created by other survivors. Like I really stopped caring about my classes and stuff after all this shit happened to me. Mm-hmm. And I, I became super public about it on campus. And that's when so many people would start telling me about the horrible things that were done to them on campus. And I realized like, this is a fucking epidemic. Like this is horrible. Like this is so much more prevalent than I ever thought it could be. And it's being perpetuated and enabled by these people in power. And it's disgusting. And I ended up forming um, Survivor Support Network that year, which was literally just a collection of students. We had flyers that just had our phone numbers everywhere where basically if you need help getting food to your dorm, because guess what? Like a lot of survivors have to share the campus with the person that hurt them. Mm. And a lot of the times, like if you go to get a no contact order, which is kind of like a restraining order on campus, but they always pick the rapist side. Like the rule is like, oh, whoever gets there first gets to stay, but the rapists never leave. Mm. So they have, we created survivor support network so that people would be like, yo, like I need somebody to walk me to the cafeteria. I'm scared to go alone. I'm scared to walk home after dark. Like somebody please walk me here. Or if you wanted to report, like we had made a reporting handbook with everything that you need to know about the real reporting process and how it actually is. And then we would help and go to your meetings with you. We would help get your evidence together. Like we would do everything. Wow. And we just took care of each other because the campus, Wesleyan wasn't going to do it. Wesley right. was not going to do it because there's a lot of money in it for them. Let's just say that. But that project literally just changed, completely changed the trajectory of my entire life. Like it, it really did. And I, re- I, I, re- I was like, this is what I want to do. 
this is what I, what I want. I want to feel like that. I want to feel that power and just like that strength that comes from inside of me. Like I needed that. And it came in a place when like I was completely broken, completely broken. Like I had, no, I had nothing. I, everything that I had had been taken away from me all because I chose to report this person and reclamation gave me my power back. And it made me realize that like, that there were just, there was just like a lot of things from my life that I was missing. Yeah. A lot of things. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing. I am a, a little speechless just because that was, yeah. It was a lot. I know. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was, it, it was really important. And I'm glad that you shared all that. I just think that I'm so happy that you were able to like take a piece of yourself back, like through this project and you did not deserve what happened to you. It's really fucked up. Everything that you're saying about schools supporting rapists and fraternities being incubators for sexual assault, like that is prevalent everywhere. I know as someone who went to UC Berkeley, I was in the Greek system, like every single person that I know has been sexually assaulted in one form or another. It is absolutely appalling and Greek life just shouldn't exist. Like at the end of the day, it just, there's, there's no need for it. People can make friends in other ways. It's terrible, but these photos are very powerful listener. If you want, Madam Namia, what's your website where people can look at reclamation? So you can check it out at namio.party. That's my website. And I believe it, all the photos are up on a Tumblr site that you can see. I believe it's reclamation.tumblr. Whatever, but it's on my website. I'm pretty sure. Okay. It's- okay, cool. So speaking of things that empower us, right? And empower you specifically. You mentioned earlier that you're an esthetician and a sugarist, which you mentioned this word. And for folks who are listening who didn't know, because I didn't know this either before Madame Namio explained it to me, but it involves body hair removal, right? Mm-hmm. And so I would love for you to describe what you're doing in this space, what that looks like for your clients. Uh, you're also opening a salon space. Like again, you're a very passionate person, have a lot going on. From what I understand about this part of yourself is this is a very empowering thing that you're doing for yourself and others that brings you joy. So I'd love to hear more about it. Yeah. So sugaring is a form of hair removal that is basically it's a paste made out of lemon, sugar and water. That's it. It's a water soluble paste. Um, You can basically like pick it up and mold it against the skin And it does wonders for refining hair growth. And it's also like there's less live skin pulling. So like no skin rips and things like that. So that's always good. And I definitely was able to pick up that skill a lot faster. And I feel like I was able to really engage with my clients in that field and a faster and healthier way because of my years as a dominatrix before, because you learn how to read body language. You learn how to do pain management with people, which is really, really important. And most importantly, you also understand that like, it's not a conveyor belt service. Everyone is different and every body is different and needs different things. And that's why you need to communicate with your clients. I always communicate with my clients. I let them know where I'm going to go before I do it, what I'm going to do. Um, hey, like, how does this feel? Did it feel better when I do this? And as somebody who has had pretty severe PTSD since I was about like 15, 13, 15, since I was a kid, a lot of people have trauma especially when it comes to their bodies and especially in this field because Unfortunately, a lot of this industry revolves around shame because shame is extremely profitable. Yes, powerful. Shame is extremely profitable. If you get people 
to feel really gross or ashamed of things going on with their body that are completely normal, they will get desperate and they will start buying shit to get rid of it. And like, not really, you know, like that's just kind of the culture that we live in. And the experience that I try to cultivate with my clients is to kind of educate them on their skin, their body. Like why does body hair grow this way? Why is it that when, for example, if you're sugaring or removing hair on the vulva, the top, like by the clitoral hood, I like to call that point the cupid's bow, the hair there to remove it, super painful. It's super painful. And people are always like, oh, it sucks that it's so painful there. And it's like, okay, well, let's talk about why that is. The hair is going to be a lot denser and a lot deeper and a lot more ingrained into the skin because our brains don't understand that we wear clothes now to protect us. So hair is for protection. So it's like, we want to protect like the insides of the labia. Like we want to protect all the hair that's in there. So that's why the hair that's on the outside of it is so deeply rooted because our brains are like, no, this is for protection. So everything is there for a reason. But now that we've evolved to certain things where we don't really need that anymore, we can look at our body hair as another form of self-expression. Like, how do you want it to look? Because that's the other thing too. We live in a society that tries to tell us like, this is what looks good for everybody. And that's bullshit. That's fucking bullshit. And also the people that you're aspiring to look like, they don't even look like that. They don't even yes. look like that. They are airbrushed to shit. That's why I love, I love those like close up Getty images of like oh, yeah. faces. I love like real those. texture. Yeah. And it's beautiful. Yeah. Skin is textured. Skin has texture to it. That's totally normal. That's totally fine. That's part of being a person. Everybody has pores. Everybody has skin texture. Some people have more than others. And it is what it is. Those are all super normal. Th- people, everybody has hyperpigmentation. Like if you a bit thick, like you have hyperpigmentation. And what is hyperpigmentation? Hyperpigmentation happens because our body releases melanin as a form of protection because it's kind of figured, it's like, hey, what's going on with the skin over here? What's going on? And it'll release melanin as a form of protection. It's not, it doesn't mean that you're dirty. It doesn't mean that you're gross. It means that you're healthy. Mm. Your skin is working the way that it should. And we need to have more conversations about it And that's why I really like being able to give a space to my clients where like I get to teach them things because, you know, I think it's fucking crazy that we all have skin. I'm sorry. There's no one walking around here like fucking Vecna with no skin on. Everybody's got (laughs) skin. Okay. Like you should know what's going on, but there's a reason they're not going to teach you about it because the less you know, the more shit you'll buy that will end up fucking your skin up. And then, you know, you'll like, buy more. Exactly. Exactly. And then you grow up because, like, I always tell everybody there is, you are making somebody so much money when you hate yourself. Mm. When you hate yourself and hate your body. Yeah. That and fat phobia go ha- Fat phobia is a mi- like million, million dollar industry. Oh, billion for billion. sure. Yeah. And for what, like, that's why people, gang so hard against fat people because fat people throw all that shit right back in your face and kind of prove to you like actually no (laughs) everything's just fine everything's fine I don't have to like live like that to be happy I don't have to look like that to be healthy to be happy to be sexy to be hot like I don't have to and that's why people hate people so much because they throw that billion dollar industry back in your face and say fuck you and that's the way that it kind of, that, that people really need to be. Honestly, there's no shame in your body. There's no shame mm-hmm. in the way that your labia looks. Like the amount of times that people will apologize to me before mm-hmm. I give them a service being like, oh, sorry. Like, I know my labia looks weird. No, it's different. It's literally it's a you. different. 
Yeah. I always tell yeah. you want to think about it like you are literally walking around with an infinity stone between your legs. Nobody else has that. Nobody. Yeah. And the fact that you said, you know, like you've seen thousands, like you like similar, I guess, to a gynecologist, right? Who's the only mm-hmm. other profession who really is seeing that many vulvas, you know, right? Like how different folks look that different hair looks very different, different colors, different shapes, different labia. And I really love this idea of like hair as self-expression. I think Mm -hmm. that there are some black creators who I've seen on TikTok who very much like live in line with this idea. And it's really beautiful to see like the ways in which body hair can be shaped and not shaped and just the ways in which that we can use it as part of our identity in the way that we express ourselves and look. Mm -hmm. And there's such like a freedom to it too. Like once you realize like, oh, I don't have to, what do I want? Yeah. What do I want to look like? Like, what do I want my hair to look like? Like that, once you kind of get to that place, it's so liberating. Like, cause then you can, you can do whatever you want. You can do whatever right. you want. There's somebody whose armpits that I do where like, we don't take all the armpit hair off. I do a little diamond. Love it. That's what she wants. Or like, I have somebody who, he has beautiful, beautiful chest hair and he kind of wants it to flow down to the groin area to like meld into kind of like the pubic hair in a way. So like, I'll like sugar along the sides so that it's kind of like a nice arrow going down to the groin area. Like there's so much you can do. There's so much you can do. And that's like, you're going to beat yourself up for not looking like somebody else when like no one else looks like you. Mm. No one else looks like you. That's so special. That's so like, what do you want to look like? Like, what do you want to do with your body? Like, let's think about that. Because if you're going to keep comparing yourselves to other people who, let's be real, those other people don't even fucking look like that. They do not look like that. They are all airbrushed to fucking shit. Or some of them, like, some people do get plastic surgery too, which is cool. Yeah, do your thing, whatever. I have, like, a whole thing with, like, plastic surgery. I think it's, like, really interesting and really cool. Like, any kind of body modification is pretty interesting to me and really Mm. cool, but, like, you got to make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons. Like, don't do it that you look like somebody who doesn't even look like that. Like, that's not, mm-hmm. you know, if I'm taking care of clients, like, I also let them know, like, listen, like, pain is normal. So how are we going to deal with this pain? Like, do you want to scream? Go for it. Mm. You want to yell? Go for it. You want to smoke a joint? I don't give a shit. Go for it. Like, whatever, like, or, or we come up with things that, like, I have one client, she puts on the same episode, Back to Star Galactica, every time. That's the way that she does it. Cool. Yeah. I mean, whatever calms you down. Yeah. That, wow. This interview has been so much more about, like, body empowerment and, like, reclaiming power. Uh, I think that is, that should be the name of the episode, reclaiming power. Like, it's very, it's very, very meaningful, all the things that you're doing and clearly the way in which you're like living with your values and using your experience to offer joy and like realness and authenticity for other people in their bodies and minds is really, really special. So thank you so much for being with us today. I'm wondering if you can just share with our listeners where they can find you if they want to follow you. Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram and TikTok at Lisa Spliffson. And you can find me on Twitter at Madam Namio, or you can check out my website, Namio period party. Amazing. Thank you so much, Madam Namio. It has been such a pleasure, no pun intended, and a true joy getting to know you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Our creator, host, and executive producer is me, Danielle Bezalel, aka DB. Our co-producer and communications lead is Katherine Cohen. Our co-producer is Brian Peoples. Our social media intern is Sarah Kelly. Our music theme is by Hook Sounds. Thank you so much to our featured guests, partners, and our listeners. Want to advertise with us? Email us at sexedwithdb at gmail.com. 
For more sex ed content, follow us on IG at Sex Ed with DB Podcast and on TikTok at Sex Ed with DB. See you next time.